Good morning, Epiphany Fellowship. Come on, one more time. Good morning, Epiphany Fellowship. Yeah. Y'all excited to be here today? Come on, y'all say, come on, y'all be getting a little louder today. You excited to be here today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't stand yet. Go ahead, go ahead, sit down, go ahead, sit down. I just want to welcome y'all to Epiphany Fellowship. Uh, I'm, let me let me address, you know, two groups of people. First, let me say hello to all those in the building. Welcome, 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 welcome. Yeah. This is what I want to do. I want to do. I want to collectively say hello to our virtual viewers. Can we say hello to our virtual viewers? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Listen, we're excited that you guys are here with us today. Um, it's going to be an amazing Sunday service. I can't wait to what is coming uh, up next. And so um, let me do a few things before we move any further. Uh, some housekeeping rules. One, uh, please, for all those in the building, if you could please keep your mask on at all times. We're just trying to take care of one another. And so if you could do that for us, that would be an amazing thing. Also, if you feel like you've dapped somebody up one too many times, Go ahead and go to the hand sanitizer station. They are all around the building. Uh, go ahead, rub it in real good. But then somebody also told me that once you do that, you know, it's a, it's a dry effect that happens on the hand. And so go ahead and get some lotion too. Put that on there. Amen. Amen. Um, then also for our virtual viewers, please leave some, some comments in the chat. We are going to engage you. We want you to feel like you are here with us. And so we're excited that both groups of people, one more time, make some noise for Jesus Christ. I said make some noise for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me pray for us. Let me pray for us. So we can go ahead and stay because we're about to get into worship. We'll sing some songs into our great God. Let me pray for us. And then we're going to be in the hands of our worship ministry. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity uh, to glorify uh, the name of Jesus, to lift up the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that you uh, would even begin to work now, that we would be able to experience you in a new and in a fresh way, that we, um, coming way down, we would uh, leave lifted um, because we have a God who reigns supreme. Lord, would you be with us? Be with the word that comes today. Uh, be with uh, our lips and our, our hands as we lift up praises to you. Lord, would you be glorified even now. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ and every glad heart say, Amen. Good morning once more. I'm excited to be here, guys. It's such a privilege to be able to gather. I hope that's something we... Yes, you can clap. I hope for myself, at least, that's something I, I don't take for granted again. It's just what a privilege it is to be able to gather. And we know that through God's scripture that that is important, gathering, and it's powerful when we gather. So I'm just excited to see how God moves this morning. Uh, you guys are already standing, which is great. So, so let's get to worshiping. Let's lift our hearts up to Jesus. Sins of 
book of Romans chapter 8 the first line just says there is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus and that's a line that I know many of us have heard a lot but it's a line that I know I need every day just to remind myself that Jesus has paid the debt in full and that there is now no consequence for us no consequence of our sin I hope that as we sing this next song that you're your mind and your heart would just wander on that truth that Jesus has paid it all. Let's sing together.
Psalms, the description that says, the mountains melt like wax before our God. And I love that description so much because that same God who is so powerful that these huge rock structures melt like cheap candles before him is the one who knows our name, the one who counts the hairs on our head. And we get to worship him this morning. How great is our God. Let's lift our voices up. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart.
thank you. You are so unfathomably great, God. And yet, you love us, God. And you call us your own, and we are your sons and daughters. God, we thank you that we get to serve you. Pray that you would use this morning in a mighty way, God. That you would move in our hearts and, and stir in our hearts, God. We love you so much. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. We say great, great are you, Lord. Come on. Yeah. It's your breath. It's your in our hearts, so we fall. Hey, whoa, it's your breath, so we fall. Well, go ahead and pour if you're going to do it. Come on. It's your breath, it's your breath in our hearts. So here we are, we're pouring out. Yeah. Can we do it one time real big? Let's go. So we, come on, lift it up. Oh, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour. Hey, yeah. in our lungs. So we pour. Yeah, yeah. Just the voices. It's your breath. It's your breath. So we pour. Well, go ahead and pour out your heart. Go ahead and pour out to him. Whatever you're in need of, pour out to him. Yes, yeah. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, yeah. Come on, say great. He is indeed great. Come on, if you know he's great, can you just make some noise? Come on, can we speak well of our God to the great God, to the one who sits upon the throne, who never ceases to reign and rule? Come on, he's great. He's great. He's great. Come on, tell him of his greatness. Speak the well of your father. He's great. Yeah, great are you. Yeah. And all the earth will shout. <laughs> oh, we got to oh, I'm sorry, it feels real good. These bones will sing. It'll say great. Ah. I don't want to get tired, so I'm going to keep it moving. Oh. If you know he's great, if you experience him being great, we'll, we'll go ahead and say, I'm done, I'm done. Sit, 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 sit. That's it, that's it. That's it. That's it. Have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Indeed, our God, indeed, our God, indeed, our God is great. Yeah. Woo! All right. Yes, he is great. Yes, he is great. 
indeed our God is great. We don't have to go far in your own personal life. You don't have to go far to experience the greatness of our God. You don't have to go far. But if, if at any time, if at any time you feel discouraged, you can look throughout Scripture how great our God is. Moses testifies about his greatness. Abraham testifies about his greatness. Paul testifies about his greatness. I can go down the list. But the beautiful part is we can testify about his greatness. And so we say thank you. Well, this is the opportunity where we can show how great he is and how he provides for us oh so often. And so we're going to just look through some scriptures as we give today with a joyful heart. Let's look together. Who is the owner of all things? Who provides for us? Who are we? Uh, how are we to respond? For just a few a few things of information for us uh, to give, you can give online at epiphanyfellowship.org slash give. That's for anybody who is even in here and don't have, you know, we ain't get our little envelopes and put them in. We ain't do all that, you know. We, we ask y'all to give still. Amen. Um, that's a way you can give. Also, we encourage everybody, everybody, everybody say church center. Please download the Church Center app, and you can also give there. I have a few announcements, and then we're going to pray and continue on. Uh, one of the bigger announcements. Let me see which one I should do first. I'm going to do this one. The big announcements on September 19th. Some of y'all already know what it is. September 19th, Epiphany Fellowship turns 15. Make some noise for 15 years. Yeah. Yes. Indeed, that is another way. Uh, God just flexes his greatness that we made it 15 years. Amen. Listen, here's a few uh, few things for uh, what's happening on September 19th. It, it'll, it'll be, we're going back to the, you know, how we first originally started. We used to do uh, outside events. We put tents and we put stages up. We're going outside to Diamond Street. We're going to block off. Yeah, come on, make some noise. Yeah, that's why we're here to engage our neighborhood so we're going to be outside so we need you to invite a friend invite people i know people are a little leery about you know covid no I, we are too but we're going to be outside so it's you know some space and some air openness you know to go ahead and invite um it's going to be free food music bounce houses for the kids face painting all that it's going to be such a amazing time to celebrate uh, and the service will be outside amen this will be outside now we need your help um it, you know, we, we always want to serve our neighborhood well. And so how we do that is how we give also. And so um, we have a tab in our uh, on our website uh, for you to give specifically to um, uh, this this uh, this anniversary. So please, please do that. Um, this is outside of your normal giving. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And so please give to that. The next thing is we heard last week is the Epiphany Academy. Come on, make some noise for Epiphany Academy. <laughs> Yeah, we are super excited to launch uh, Epiphany Academy. Um, it's for our after, it's our after school program, and so uh, there's so many things that uh, we need your help with. Um, of course, donations and things like that. Um, but we are looking for um, two paid uh, part-time positions for a director. Amen. So if you know somebody who's qualified, you you qualify. Come on, one more time, qualified. 
please let them know about this amazing opportunity. Well, I'm done. Um, Y'all probably won't see me no more, but I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to continue on with our worship gathering. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunities which we uh, are able to give. Um, Many can look and say, man, I, I, I don't have it, but there are many of us who can say, man, I can give, and I can give joyfully and and with cheer. And so, Lord, I pray that you would honor our giving today, that the name of Jesus Christ would go far and wide so that people would see him and him lifted up alone, and they would say, what must I do to be saved? Lord, bless our giving. Bless the giver. Uh, Would you return to them? But they have given with joyful, uh, with joyful hearts. Would you be so gracious to us, Lord Jesus? We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, and every glad heart said, amen. 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 Would you, would you stand with us again once more as we continue our time in worship?
I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. Know you more. I want to know. living God we surrender we surrender it all we surrender our burdens to you the word says cast your cares upon you because you care for us and Jesus thank you for being our burden bearer and you are worthy to be praised Jesus and we come here to celebrate you we don't take it for granted and we are excited and ecstatic to connect with you but also to one another Lord, refresh us in our time together. In Jesus' name, everybody agree with that said? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, open your Bibles to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. Um, it's a great week. I know uh, Friday we got to take our son to college, our oldest, and, um, and uh, others have dropped their kids off. I know. Uh, some people text me, some of our family members inbox me, uh, people in the church are saying, hey, we sent ours too, we sent ours too. And so shout out to those of you who are watching, who are college students watching from your campus. Um, shout out to them. Let's give them a shout out, y'all. My son just texted me. I said, you watching, boy? He said, yes. So, um, so we're thankful. Hopefully they can also find something connected there as well. Uh, for relationships. How many of you know when you go away from home, you need some Christian friends too? Amen. I mean, you need somebody to keep you out of trouble. You know, some of us left home to get in trouble. Oh, y'all ain't going to, I'm preaching, y'all know I'm preaching already. You got out the house because you ain't want no structure. Nobody, you wanted to see what it was like to just act a fool. And, um, you know, praise God for those who are still tuning in. Who you're saying, I still want to hear from Jesus, even though I'm away from my parents. Amen. 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 Blessings to you. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Uh, 1, 2, 3, read. Amen. We are starting a new series today. This new series is called Deconstructing Your Faith. Deconstructing Your Faith. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why we're doing this series, but this is the series intro today. Father, you are um, not surprised by us not surprised about our decision-making skills, um, our craftiness or lack thereof. And with all of our quirks and frailties, you still are in hot pursuit of us. And God, I'm believing in this series that you're in hot pursuit of some people that are having a crisis in faith, um, that are having a crisis of identity, significance, and purpose. And God, I am begging you um, 
to throw your weight around and help them to know that you haven't forgotten about them. Help them to know that you're not scared of their questions. You're not, you're, you're not depressed by their doubt. Um, but God, you are committed to them more than they can ever think. And Lord God, teach us as the church how to love doubters. Help us to learn how to love even haters of you and the church. Lord God, teach us the law of love. It's a hard lesson to learn to love who you don't want to love. Um, but God, the church needs to learn in this era how to be better lovers of people who for many reasons don't understand because we've done a poor job. So Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and redeemer in whom we trust. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I'm talking about what is deconstructing faith. Um, I, to be honest, I, I usually develop my, in my preaching calendar, usually about 24 months. Uh, I usually try to pray, get with God in some way, shape, or form, and really develop a 24-month um, preaching calendar. I like to kind of know where we're going, but every now and then the Holy Ghost will throw an audible. The plans of a man, man's heart plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps, right? And, um, and, and as we were about to embark on a series, as I was coming back from sabbatical, I started j jumping back into social media a little bit just to kind of get a feel for things. And then listening over the years of what I've heard people say, and some videos came up. And interestingly enough, the Holy Spirit, I, was dri I think I was driving to get my kids some donuts. And I stopped the car because too much information was coming to me. And I just pulled out my notepad on my phone and just wrote out the series. And that's how I knew it was the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and I was like, I don't know how my media team, I know they're frustrated probably with me, but we're going to figure this out because we need to do this series. Um, and I, and I don't, I'm not trying to over, you know, hype the, 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 you know how you can over, you know, the Holy Ghost gave it to me and I felt it and I know it's the season time that you hear this word today. Somebody under the sound of my voices, you know, yeah, yeah, I know y'all like all that, you know. And that, that actually kind of is true, you know, somebody under the sound of my voice. God's going to let you loose during this series. No, oh God, oh, God. And listen, listen, if I was in the Pentecostal, I'd say, put some sanitizer in your hand and touch your neighbor and say. <laughs> ah. But, um, you know, um, I think this series is important for many reasons because it's nothing new. Faith deconstruct, we just, you know, this generation, what I love about y'all is y'all got categories and terms for stuff that people have been dealing with and y'all think is new because you got a category that you never heard of before that you're saying now, but it's been happening for millennia. Faith deconstruction is nothing new, but I do think that you all are dealing with something in this generation that's never been done and experienced in any other generation, and that's the way information is passed. The way information is passed and packaged and disseminated in volume, the level of volume with the devil. You, I mean, ain't nothing like volume and the devil together. That's a potent combination for influence, <laughs> right? And so, and so today, and all of it, and let me say this, de all deconstruction ain't the devil. And I'm going to talk to you about there is a such thing as good deconstruction. When we talk about this idea of deconstructing faith, I've been seeing different people saying, you know, I've left the Christian faith. I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating my faith. You know, I, I'm backing up. And I'll talk about some of those categories. And I want y'all to be patient with me. Because this is a series, unlike others, where I'm learning in the process. Okay? So I want you to be, can y'all be patient with me? And then I want to I wanna learn in my communication how not to demonize people who doubt. Are y'all hearing me? So, that I, you know, I may make a mistake. I may have something unclear. But can y'all love on me, too, in the process? You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to love on you. We're going to learn to love each other. But, and so I'm, I hopefully I'm humbly coming into the series because I know that someone that's dealing with deconstruction, is you're going to be on the defensive because you're going to feel like this series is made to attack you. 
And the series is not made to attack you. It's a platform for dialogue for you to be able to come out of hiding in your deconstruction so that we can work together to get some answers you may need. Is that okay? So, 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 so real quick, so, so when, when I talk about deconstructing, deconstructing is deconstruction is the process of reevaluating your core beliefs. Stop. Give me time for the introduction, please. Um, you know, they, 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 you, 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 I think it's actually healthy to, 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 to process and evaluate and reevaluate your core beliefs. Because, uh, and, and there's a number of reasons why I believe that that's extremely important. Not only that, or evaluating whether or not the religious belief system you were nurtured in is what you have really embraced. Are you hearing? In other words, you have to come to a point, if you, particularly if you're raised in a Christian home, an environment, like as much as we want to raise our kids, we bring them to church, they watch them take communion, you know, they may have got baptized at a certain point when, they, when we, they made a profession of faith, whether for, because some of us have forced our kids to a profession of faith. Uh-oh. You going to trust Jesus, you know, and I don't think that's healthy. You know, um, you need to give your kids room to be unbelievers. Now I'll explain that. Now some of y'all are like, what is this pastor talking about? You can't, only the, the Bible says no one confess Jesus as Lord except by the Spirit of God. Yeah. So, so, so you can't, you're like, you may force a conversion and have a nice little public thing when you cry and invite the family to take pictures on baptism day, but you just got yourself, your, your kid just went swimming if they're not saved. You understand? And so it's very important, I, as much as we want our kids to get saved, we have to pray for them, give them room, and plant seeds. That don't mean, I would just, see, this is the demonic thing. Just let them figure out what they want to be. That's nowhere in God's kingdom. The Bible says train them up in the way that they should go, and when they get old, they should not depart from it. In other words, it's your job to be a scatterer of seeds in both life and lips. See, some of us got lips. But the main thing our kids remember is our life. Okay? And so, and so, but everybody comes to this point, particularly if you grew up in the faith. I got to move. Um, deconstruction isn't new. It has become more complex and extensive, I'd say. So, why is deconstruction necessary? Y'all track it with me? Number one, so that you can own the faith for yourself. So that you... Can own, please be patient with me. This is a long introduction, but I have to do this for those who don't understand. Y'all with me? So that you can own your faith yourself. Number two, to find out what you really believe. Listen, it's a lot of people under the sound of my voice. I know that I preach things that are Orthodox Christian faith and you don't believe it. But you come here every Sunday. Because I see the post you like. It comes up in my algorithm. And it's okay. And I'm not beating you up. I'm just saying I know that there is not continuity, right? <clears throat> also, <clears throat> deconstruction is necessary to realize you may not be a Christian. And that's a gift. It's a gift to know authentically whether you're a believer or not. Because then we know what we need to do. Okay? <clears throat> and then to start, also deconstruction is important to start the journey of authentic faith. So, let me break this down. Y'all still with me, right? There, there's good deconstruction and there's bad deconstruction. Let's, let's break down. Let, let me give you a good example of, of good, good uh, deconstruction, right? Core, core belief evaluation is what we'll call it, right? It's, Frederick Douglass said it, most, his most famous quote. This is, this is he was, de do you know the slaves were deconstructing the difference between the Christianity of the slave master and the Christianity of the Bible? They weren't stupid. I, I, know, that, I know some of their slang sound like they were, but they were smarter than their vernacular. <laughs> let, let me, let me, let me, let, now all of them didn't have vernacular off, but it was because of the way we were educated or the lack thereof. Frederick Douglass says, this is, this is one of the most famous deconstructing statements, and to me, one of the best ones. He says, between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the wildest possible difference. 
so wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. He says, I love the pure, peaceable, impartial Christianity of Christ. I like that one. He says, I therefore hate the corrupt slave holding, uh, holding uh, women whipping, cradle plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. He says, indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religions of this land Christianity. That's deconstruction at its best. Because what, did, what was he able to do? He didn't take the Christianity that was given to him as authentic Christianity. He evaluated and saw its core beliefs and then went to the Bible and said, what is the Bible's core beliefs? Let me take a biblical worldview and put it on what I'm being told is a worldview and then be able to weigh the difference between what I'm actually given from what Christ actually is like. That's masterful deconstructing of a former slave. Right? <clears throat> um. Bad deconstruction. Bad deconstruction. It's saying that, uh, uh, saying things that Christianity doesn't say. That's, let me, please hear me here. It's very important, like <clears throat> misinterpreting the Bible, right? Uh, and making human suffering God's fault. I watched a video, <laughs> and I was, as I was watching the video of this young lady, it was interesting that her crisis in faith came when she saw human suffering that she perceived that God didn't do anything about, that he should have done something about, and therefore it made her deconstruct her faith because of her confusion about human suffering. When human suffering was initiated really by humans putting ourselves in suffering by this passage right here, right? So what are some triggers of deconstruction? Y'all still tracking with me? Triggers, number one, the problem of evil and suffering, we just said that. Church hurt can be a trigger. College life can be a trigger. Family upbringing, hypocrisy, legalism, spiritual abuse, moral failure in leadership can be a trigger. Illegitimate or legitimate or misplaced hurt. So why do people deconstruct their faith? Legalism in their family, hypocrisy, Spiritual, emotional, and physical abuse, bad information, Western imperialism, confronted with questions they can't answer, personal suffering they may experience, the faith not adding up, lack of discipleship, and a desire to throw certain moral restraints off. So where are people going to? People are going to mystery cults. They're going to alternative spiritualities, limbo, and nowhere. So, Genesis 3, I got one point and one point only, <laughs> and I'm out your way. One point and one point only. The wisdom of God is sufficient to handle our deconstruction. The wisdom of God is sufficient to handle our deconstruction. Mm. Um, this passage is, is, is masterfully written by the author. And, 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 and I don't know if you know this, but so many of our series began in Genesis. You, have you over the years? Because so much can be preached from the first three books of Genesis to show so many things that it's the foundation for it doesn't even make sense. Whether it's marriage, whether it's singleness, whether it's work, whether, I mean, so much comes out of the word. That's how inexhaustible God's word is. Look at, look at verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more cunning most cunning of all wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Stop. Now, before we get to his question to the woman, let's talk about who Satan is. I think many of us have a misunderstanding of who Satan is. Most of us, you know, if you grew up like me watching Tom and Jerry, you think Satan is a red dude, dark red with horns and a t pointed tail, and he's in hell waiting for you to get there so that he can do something to you. Well, let's deconstruct that. 
Hell belongs to God, not Satan. That's number one. Number two, oh, I'm not going to do that because that's going to, Satan is scared of hell. I'll just say it like that. Really, really scared. So he don't want, he's never been there before, and he's scared to go there, okay? And he's not ugly. I'm explaining that from the Bible. Now, Satan ain't never been ugly, and he ain't going to give you nothing ugly. Y'all will get that on the way home. Y'all going to get that on the way home. Anyway, who's the serpent? Well, Ezekiel, you, you have to understand, in, in Ezekiel, it, it talks about the fact, in Ezekiel 28, that Eden was a temple, right? Eden was the meeting place of God and man. It overlapped heaven and earth. Calling Satan a serpent here isn't actually saying that animals talked. Are y'all listening to me? One like lions is walking around like, what's up, my man? Go ahead and pet your boy. Go ahead and pet your boy. You know, no. That, uh, lions just didn't bother you prior to the fall. They, they roared and did all they do, right? <sighs> this, is, this is figurative language. You'll see Revelation call him the serpent of old, right? Now, when you look at um, Ezekiel 28, 13, it says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every kind of precious stone covered you. Uh, carnelian, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis, uh, lazuli, turquoise, and emerald. Your mountings and settings were crafted in gold. They were prepared on the day you were created. You were an anointed carib. carib. Now, Understand this, you are an anointed guardian carob. That's very important. Satan was not leading choirs in heaven. We need to stop using Isaiah to say that. Because we make him a musician, this calls him a guardian. That's key. Now, what did the cherubim do? The cherubim do? In Exodus, when the Ark of the Covenant was erected, they covered the mercy seat. Are y'all staying, y'all, this is all this good foundation, y'all stay with me. And because he covered the mercy seat, he had access to God, but never saw him by his face. Because none of the heavenly hosts except Yahshua has ever seen God face to face. Nobody can see him face to face. Even those based on Isaiah 6 that are in his presence cover their faces in his presence while Jesus sits on the throne at the right hand of God. Stay with me so that you can understand who Satan is. Him being a guardian mean he was anointed to be a fighter. He wasn't a worship leader, he was a fighter. <clears throat> he guarded stuff, <clears throat> which means he knows military tactics. That means he knows how to put hands on somebody spiritually and naturally. That's very important. When Satan fell, which is in the next section of the chapter, is when he fell, there was no falling before the fall. You can't use Revelation 12 for that. That's post-Genesis 3 in the latter period. Y'all got quiet on that part. <laughs> right here, the reason why she's comfortable is because the heavenly hosts were all around. So when he came up to her, she wasn't like, oh, a snake, talk. let me just talk to a snake. Like she's so innocent, snakes and everything. No, he's a heavenly being. Why? Because I don't have time to go through it, but when you look through Ezekiel, uh, cherubim and seraphim were able to, uh, they were able to shape shift into different creatures. This is very important because when Satan fell, he kept the same abilities without God's grace. I want you to really uh, he's intellectual. He's emotional. Because he was a worshiper because he was one of God's heavenly hosts. All of them are worshipers, but he was intellectual and he a fighter. So you have to understand <coughs> why I'm doing this. So he said the Satan was, uh, the, the, the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field. He's using it to talk about the heavenly hosts or the wild animals, right? 
He says, in, in, in meaning he's shrewd, he's crafty, he's discerning, and he's sensible. That's why the Bible says he goes about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Why? Because he's a master psychologist. Before there was a PhD in psychology, there was Satan. So I want you to understand what's happening here. So, one of the things I like about it, though, is as beautiful and as glorious as he is, guess it was, guess what the text says? He, he was more cunning than all of the animals that the Lord God had made. <laughs> At the end of the day, that fool a created being. I want you to keep that in mind, that a created being, a created being, although spiritual, is an eternal in, in, in a way, not eternally existing, but eternal in the fact that he can't die in the same way we can. I want you to keep all of that in mind, right? He said to the woman, this is interesting, he, and, and this is, ladies, I want y'all to hear me in the nicest way, he he, he went out of order on purpose. Yeah. He, he went to the woman, not because the woman was dumb like people say. The man is just as dumb here as the woman. <laughs> this wasn't an intellectual issue. This was a disrespect issue. <laughs> let, 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 so, 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 so stay with me. I want y'all to truck with me through this. I'm going to walk as slow as I can. <clears throat> so, so, so in the text it says, did God really say? Deconstruction question number one. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Satan, based on Isaac, uh, Ezekiel, had already deconstructed his faith. Because he had determined in his heart that he was going to make his throne higher than God's. Yeah. And in that thought of Futility and stupidity, he's using her and him as the means to get something from them that God had given to them. That's why deconstructing has to be very careful. Because you could be forfeiting something, talking to an enemy, that really making you think you're getting something that you're actually not getting. Stay with me. Stay with me. He said, did he really say? In other words... <laughs> it's interesting that he doesn't have venom as a snake, but he has venom as a verbalizer. So why, why is this important? Because what he wants to do is he wants you to question God. Now, what's interesting, up to Genesis to this point, it uses Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. It's interesting that in the text, in your text, when it says Yahweh, it says Lord, all caps. But it's interesting that Satan didn't follow the pattern that Genesis was writing in. He didn't say Lord God. He said God for a very important reason. Because he wanted to, whenever you invoke Yahweh, that's covenant language. Whenever you just use God, particularly in this instance, not always, but in this instance, is you trying to talk non-covenantally about stuff. That's why we got to stop saying, I, I, I know the Bible don't say this, and I'm not saying this as a Christian. We got to be very careful of that, of non-covenantal language. I'm by myself. So questioning, this type of stuff people question, is church attendance necessary? Do I really got to be around people? Like, why can't I just read my Bible by myself? Like, I feel better being around myself and God and not other people. That's Satan's tactic of influencing you to think that God built you to be alone when the cross was a two-way street. It was both vertical and horizontal. Stay with me. <clears throat> questioning. So, and there's some good questions. Questioning the bad doctrine, church doctrine and bad experiences versus allow, evaluating them with faith. It's very important. <coughs> that, these, that sometimes these questionings come in that way. Some people say it's self-study sufficient to lead into truth. Does the Bible even teach that, right? Uh, is Jesus the only way? See, the devil has a way of doing it. What happened to all the people in the past that died? Why, how could God let all the people die? What happened to the people before Jesus Christ? And then that's your starting point. Then you're saying, well, if everybody went to hell before Jesus, but that's not what the Bible ever says. But we come to conclusions based on 
a question from a cunning person, right? Very, very important. Is the Bible, is the faith mine or is it my parents? Then he says, he says, he asked him another question. He said, you can't, you can't eat from any tree in the garden? He always wants you to focus on what you can't do. That's what he wants to do. And see, let me tell you something. Deconstructing is a process, not an event. It's, it's a little bit here. To get you, then, you, then you start looking at YouTube videos on the topic. And then when you, when you listen to about 40 of them, you feel like you read a book. I'm just being honest, right? But you don't know if you are a visual learner and, and, and people have illustrated in that. You don't know how well you've been nurtured by those videos through your, if you are 90% visual learner, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. And, and I'm going to tell you why. In, in a second, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. He always makes you focus on, listen, the mystery in your relationship with God. Y'all got to hear me this. There's some things that God will not answer. Let me, let me just, let me, let me help you out. <clears throat> let, me, let me just help you out. Listen, listen. There, there are things, there are a lot of things that God, will, the Bible says, the things revealed are for men. The things that aren't are for God. Listen, when I was little, my mama at the corner of 14th and T in Washington, D.C. I'm about to cross the street. Don't go out in the street. Now, what if I just decided to go in the street? Oh, I, but this was the wrong thing. Now, this is a little different. And my mom was raised by slaves. So you have to understand my upbringing is a little different. Some of y'all, y'all, y'all got time out. Um, I said, Why? After I got up from the floor and was like <laughs> wiping some pebbles off the curb, you know, came to my senses and the birds stopped going around my head. <laughs> Why am I saying that? I'm not saying that because God's going to beat you. Sometimes you don't need to know why. Can I, can I just say that? <clears throat> Listen, some people say, and we're going to get to it in a minute. Why did God put the tree in the middle of the thing anyway? Why he ain't just give them all good tree? Why he got to do all that? <laughs> right? Right? I'm ahead of myself. Because he wants you to choose him. Without knowing why he said no. Y'all not hearing me. See, many of you are searching for why God said no. And some of our deconstruction is not intellectual, it's moral. It's moral. Why can't I have him, God? Why can't I have her, God? Why can't I do that, God? And God's like, just trust me. Listen, experience is the worst teacher. I heard somebody say it the other day, and my grandma used to say, only a fool will go to that school. <laughs> but Satan, <coughs> Satan is, he loves to bait you out with questions to make you folly in your thinking. Now look at verse 2. Oh God, I'm just at verse 2. Y'all still with me? The woman said to the serpent, I want you to really, really read this. We may eat <coughs> from the trees in the garden. Now, know what's funny? Is that she forgot a key word. God said in chapter 216, he didn't say you can, may eat from the trees in the garden. He says you may eat freely. She removed freely. Because she didn't see herself as free. Because God gave a restriction. 
And a, and, and a lot of times when God gives us a restriction, instead of looking at what he's given us freedom to do, we look at bondage as what he didn't give us the freedom to do. Now, 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 now help me out, family of God. I don't know how many trees were in the Garden of Eden. Not only that, they were able to cultivate the ground of the entire planet and plant as many trees as they wanted to. And God said, you don't have to eat but just one tree. Just one. You have a garden, but, and I say don't do one, and you say, see how God be doing? See how, why he got to not let me have some freedom? That's how we act. And that, but that's the process of deconstructing. The enemy always want you to focus on what you can't have as if it's central to your freedom when God is trying to teach you that it's going to bound you from the things that he already freed you to enjoy. <laughs> this is so important, family. And then <clears throat> it says in verse 3, it says, but about the tree in the middle of God said, you must not eat it or touch it or will you would not see she adding stuff. God ain't say none of that. <laughs> and he put a prohibition on it. He said, dying, you shall die in the Hebrew. So, but she, she didn't emphasize that, right? And that's how Satan loves to do. But look at verse 4. He said, nah. That's how he do. Satan, Satan, Satan going to be cool with you. Listen, he ain't going to come to you with flies around his hair walking up to you and, and stink and just... He's not he gonna come up to you in the best cologne from Barney's. Help us, God. The sweetest perfume, if the you know, the nicest dress or the nicest Armani suit. He's gonna come to you with a six-pack. He gonna come to you with a briefcase. He gonna come to you as an Instagram model. Ain't no, and see, y'all ain't real. See, the, that's the problem with y'all. Y'all gonna be lost because y'all ain't gonna be real with yourself. Help me today, God. Satan comes in his best form to make sure that you have no clue who he is. And I'm telling you, and, and, and you have to have discernment for what's being said. Oh, listen. Trust that feeling that something ain't right. Y'all better learn. Don't, don't say, but, 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 but. You, but and some, some, some inside of you going, nah, nah. Fall back. But, but, I mean. <laughs> you understand? But see, Satan, <coughs> what's that? You, you, you don't feel comfortable with me? Then he'll do something to make you feel. This is how he do. He says, no. He said, I'm on your side. You won't die. That's what he's saying. He's basically saying, God's not on your side. He's a, he's a party pooper. Like, he all, like I, I've known him for a minute now. <laughs> you know, I know how he roll. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He said, the servant said to the woman, see, the set, see, he's a straight up liar. Look at verse 5. He's, now, now, this is where he go. He, he, now, he's, now, what he does is he answers her in the mystery that we talked about earlier. He always seeks to give you answers where God is quiet. Listen, listen to me. That, and this is classic deconstruction. When God is quiet, the, the person that's wrestling with crisis of faith tends to want the answers because not knowing means I can't trust him. So when someone gives you an answer, it says, I can trust you. But if God chooses to be silent, it's not because he doesn't love you. He wants you to choose him without you getting all the answers. Uh, look at what it says, though. Check it out. He says, God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be open, and you will be like, it should be translated, the gods. 
Why would he say that? Because Satan was among the Elohim. And so because he was among, he said, you, you'll be like us. You're gonna be, he acting like he got something he don't. That's how Satan be faking the phone. Selling tickets he can't cash. Overpromising and underdelivering. Listen, let me tell you something. He always, he's a good salesman. He comes with the right suit on, the right briefcase, the right technical information. He has a website up. It's like them scammers call you. Go to our website. You know, they call you and, yeah, now give me your, they start asking for your information. You know, and all of this, and what they're doing is they are just taking from you, but they look like they're professional, but really they're scam artists. Satan is a professional scam artist. He says, Satan makes you focus on mystery, and not only that, he loved to speak lies where God seemed silent. He said, you will be like God. Satan offers what, again, he doesn't have. He says, knowing good and evil. Y'all still with me? It says in verse 6, it says, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful <coughs> to look at. And that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Really underline that if you can. I really want you to highlight several words. Saw, good for food, delightful to look at. I want you to really, and it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Highlight and underline that, whatever you can do. It's very important. Number one, this points us back to the three-pronged sin of 1 John 2.16. For everything in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful, I like the old translation, pride of life, right? So it says she saw that it was good, lust of the flesh, delightful to look at, lust of the eyes, that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom, pride of life. In other words, he said, he said it was good to provide wisdom, meaning thinking independently of God. This is very important. Atheism, agnosticism, all those things, we don't demonize people that are there. But it's a commitment to thinking independently of God. He offered them an invitation to atheism. Atheos in the New Testament is what it's called. It means without God. Atheism doesn't just mean lack of belief in God. It means to be without him. And so, and so when we look at this idea, uh, the book of Proverbs actually, though, stresses that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. So what does that mean? He said, you can get wisdom on your own. He says, no, the Bible says wisdom starts with fearing God. <clears throat> what does fearing God mean? Fearing God means taking him seriously. That's really all it means. So that means if God doesn't give you an answer, that's wise. Somebody go get that on the way home. Do you really understand when, 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 you, when God says no and you say, I'm struggling, but okay, that was wise. It's unwise for you to say, why you didn't give me that wisdom that I wanted or that thing I wanted? And Satan says, look, I have it over here. You go over there. He's inviting you to being stupid, and God is trying to keep you wise. <laughs> so, so, so fearing God sometimes is really faith. It doesn't mean we have an unreasonable faith. It's anti-intellectual. That's not what I'm saying. But there are times, we, we, I wrote a book on urban apologetics. Y'all know I'm not anti-intellectual, right? But however, there are things that we should give a reason for the hope that is within us, and there are things that God hasn't given us a reason for. And no one came to Christ because of information. Listen, listen, listen. And so this, this is very important. But let me tell you what kind of wisdom he was inviting them to. James chapter 3, verse 13 through 18. <clears throat> Can I read this? I feel like y'all still with me. Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done and gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitterness, bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast 
and don't deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder in every practice. In other words, this is what the enemy is inviting her to. So fundamentally, now, uh, listen, listen, fundamentally, uh, 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 they're, they're, they're getting knowledge without covering. You'll see in a second. And what they sought, God already had. That sometimes God didn't choose to give it to you or something. It's, and sometimes it's not that God is withholding from you. It's God doesn't feel like it's the time to give it to you or give you understanding of it. But you have to be patient in the process of your walk with God in community with others to say, God hasn't shown me yet, but I trust him that maybe someday he will. And if he doesn't, I still trust him. That's the disposition that we have to have. Now, 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 now for you all who are wrestling, we encourage you as well with that. We'll, 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 we'll begin to end on this. So she ate the fruit. She gave it to her husband. And she gave it to her husband that was with her. It says, then both their eyes were open, and they knew they were naked. <laughs> so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Once you are no longer covered by God, you will constantly try to cover yourself with something. Notice the fig leaves family are dying covering. Soon as they pulled it off the vine, it's dying. Now, it looks like a covering at first, but the longer you have it on, the more it withers. Some of us don't realize that we are, we're covering ourselves with dying coverings. But the greatest thing I see in Genesis, these are some reflections for us. This is going to be a six-week series. This is just the intro. But I want to show you the origin of deconstructing. The greatest thing I see in Genesis 3, number one, the Lord gave Adam and Eve a chance to choose what he taught them versus forcing them to follow. That's number one. God will not force you to follow. That, that's, that's not how God works, right? He gave them the room. Number two. One of the things you see also, though, that's beautiful and redemptive is later he went looking for them in their failure. Let me, let me tell you something. Just because you're hostile towards God doesn't mean he's still not looking for you. He came to them right after they sinned. Adam, where are you? It wasn't that God didn't know where he was. He wanted to display to Adam that he knew he was lost. If God asks, where are you, be very afraid. Not because of what he do, but be afraid of where you are. And so he goes after them. Let me tell you, if you're deconstructing your faith, God can handle it. And as a matter of fact, when you see God talking to Adam and Eve, he interacts with them, asks them questions. He doesn't say, shut up. You know how we do as parents. When your kid starts, well, my, I just, well, shut up. Just shut it up. Don't cry. You know, God, guess what God does? God says, what were you doing? Come here. What were you doing? And he gets that. Listen, how do I know God got down to his level? Because he showed up in a physical form and was, walk, and was hovering through the garden. Which means he loved them enough. He didn't come in a storm. He didn't come. Ah! Where y'all at? He came down. He said, Shh, tuck this Shekinah. And did like this. And started hovering through the garden. He just, he just moved through the garden. Adam, where are you? Who told you you were naked? God loves you enough to talk to you like you got some sense. He love you. He, he love you. Listen, he can handle. He said, listen. And he, they started breaking down their deconstructing. And then... He spoke redemptive to them in their follow, a fallenness. Last thing, I'm done. I'm done. This is just the introduction. I can't say everything in this sermon. Last thing. Jesus in Matthew 4 gets engaged by Satan at a weak point in his fasting 
to attempt the same process on him performed on Adam and Eve. Matthew 4 is Satan trying to get the incarnate God-man to deconstruct his faith. He crazy. <laughs> Listen to how he talked to Eve. Did God say? Listen to how he talked to Jesus. If you are the son of God, he ain't come like all in the movie, you know, worms come out of his mouth and all of that. He probably had a bag of sandwiches right there, right? <laughs> While Jesus was there, you know. You hungry? You know. You know, that's how he rolled. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, Satan not going to come. He not going to act like he not your ally. He always going to act like he your ally till he get what he wants from you. And you don't hear, after Genesis 3, you don't hear Adam and Eve ever seeing Satan no more. He had a one-night stand spiritually with them and rolled out. He said, that's all, I got what I want. Now I'm the prince of power of the air now. I took it from you. Now I have access to the earth realm because of sin. <laughs> got what I wanted. And you get kicked out of the garden. The place where you, you get kicked out of your freedom. And he gets access to your, uh, your birthright. Anyway. He said, are you the son of, he said, turn these stones into bread. After that, he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. He said, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. That's, he, listen, he's trying to get him to deconstruct his faith based on being impatient with what God was going to give him. Because everything that Satan was offering, God was already going to give him on a higher level. Why? Because he because he said throw he he, he asked him first turn, he said he he said become he said turn these stones to bread well he's actually the bread of life oh ain't nobody gonna talk back to me he 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 said he said he said if you're the son of God throw yourself down well he won't need to throw himself down because when he ascends to heaven he'll ascend on a cloud all he had to do was wait. Uh, 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 he said, I will give you all the, he said, I'll give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. And the Bible says that, 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 that the God the Father has bestowed upon him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of the Father. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Everything that Satan promises you on a temporal level, God has promised and is giving on an eternal level. So I want to encourage you that Christ's death on the cross and getting up from the grave is the ability to wrestle with power. I want to encourage you as we go through this series, we're going to talk about so many different things. We're going to talk about that bad deconstruction, and we're also going to talk about good deconstruction. But guess what we're also going to talk about? Proper reconstruction. How do you, how do you, how do you rebuild from what... Need, some stuff needs to go. Some stuff needs to stay. And so my prayer is, is this, during this series, all of us, including me, all of us will have a more solid faith in Christ, and that those who don't know him will say, yo... Man, I, I believe God is leading me to put my confidence in Jesus. But those who are on the fence, they would say, I can't go anywhere. I didn't realize that I was being duped by the enemy. Father God, we thank you. We honor you for your word that will not come void. Maybe someone's here now and they already want to place their confidence in Jesus. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, he will pardon your sin if you place your confidence in him. Take you from spiritual disconnection to spiritual connection. Um, he died on the cross to bridge the gap between God and man based on what Adam and Eve did here. All of us were born separated from God. All of us were. But what's beautiful about God is that God loves us enough that he didn't let us remain in our sin without help. He sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay the cost for our sin and take us from spiritual disconnection to spiritual connection. If you're here today and want to place your confidence in Jesus Christ, we would love 
to talk to you about Jesus. Is there anyone in the room that says, I want to say yes to Jesus today? Hold your hand in the air. We'd love to talk to you about Jesus. Anyone in here today? Anyone online? If you're online, you're watching, you want to place your confidence in Jesus, death and resurrection to take you from spiritual separation from God to spiritual connection. In the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God said our relationship is over for now. But he said a seed is going to come and the serpent is going to bruise his heel. But the seed is going to crush the head of Satan. Jesus on the cross cr crushed Satan's head. Why did he crush his head? The place where information is stored. Stomping his head was to deconstruct him so that we can be constructed because of his work on the cross and resurrection. If that's you, if you search, our search team will put a link online if you want to trust Jesus. And we'd love to talk to you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for communion. <clears throat> communion, uh, everybody have communion? If you don't, hold your hand up. They gave it at the door, but if you don't have it and you are a believer, in Christ and you want to participate in communion. You got one person right here up front. Take communion. We do communion every Sunday because it's a part of the ordinances of communal commitment to Jesus. Well, we want to be constantly reminded often, often through this means of grace that we're called to live for him and that we're called to recall what he did for us and look forward to when he will return to get us and to not just get us but to be with us and us with him. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, can you imagine on the night that you're getting betrayed by some of your closest people? to have a meal with them, knowing they're going to betray you. That's how his love works. And on that night while he was being betrayed, he took the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. This is my body, which is given for you. Let us eat together. After Passover meal of the lamb and the bitter herbs. He took the cup and blessed it. This represents the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which was shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Let us drink together. Stand with me if you don't mind. Every heart and mind cleared. pray that you would continue to trek with us as we go through this series. We get to work through some great stuff together. Father, Lord God Almighty, you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And um, God, you're so trustworthy, but we act like you got to constantly prove yourself to us. Um, my prayer, my prayer is that you will help us to walk in the grace for what we don't know, and grow and learn, and what we do need to know. <clears throat> and Lord God, help you to construct in us a titanium and Teflon faith commitment to you. Lord, now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding gladness and joy to him, our God and Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Everybody agree with that said? Amen and amen. Praise God for that message. If you're like me, after hearing that, you want to sit down with somebody and have a conversation about it. Well, here's your chance. My name is Tamara Bullock, and I'm one of the members of the Surge Evangelism Team, where our goal is to help you look more like Jesus. You can reach us at surge at epiphanyfellowship.org. You can reach out to us 
if you have any questions about the message or if you just want to hear about the gospel message of Jesus for the first time. We'd love to hear from you or connect with you. Grace and peace.